Chapter 71 He recognised the copy from four miles off. Into his memory its shape was indelibly etched. The symmetrical slope of the sides cobbled with boulders that glinted dully in the sunshine, like the scales of a reptile. The flattened summit ringed by a boulder stratum of rock, the high altar on which the sacrifice to greed and stupidity had been made. Closer he could discern the aloe plants upon the slopes, fleshy leaves spiked like crowns and jewelled with scarlet blooms. On the plain below the copy, in the short brown grass, stood a long line of white specks. Sean rode towards them, and as he approached each speck evolved into a cairn of whitewashed stones, and on each stood a metal cross. Stiff from the long day in the saddle, Sean dismounted slowly. He hobbled the horses, dropped saddle and pack from their backs, and turned them loose to feed. He stood alone and lit a cheroot, suddenly reluctant to approach the line of graves. The silence of the empty land settled gently upon him. A silence not broken, but somehow heightened by the sound of the wind across the plain. The harsh tearing as his mount cropped at the dry brown grass seemed sacrilegious in this place, but it roused Sean from his thoughts. He walked towards the double line of graves and stood before one of them. Stamped crudely into the metal of the cross, the words, Here lies a brave burger. He moved along the line of crosses, and on each he read those same words. On some of them the printing was irregular. On one the R in burger had been replaced by a G. Sean stopped and glared at it, hating the man who in his haste and unconcern had made the epitaph an insult. I'm sorry, he spoke aloud apologising to the man who lay beneath it. Then he was embarrassed, angry at himself for the weakness. Only a madman speaks aloud to the dead. He strode away towards the second row of crosses. Leading Seaman W. Carter, R.N., the fat one. Corporal Henderson, C.F.S., twice in his chest and another in the belly. He walked along the line and read their names. Some were just names. Others he saw instantly and vividly. He saw them laughing, or frightened, saw the way they rode, remembered the sound of their voices. This one still owed him a guinea, he remembered the bet. Keep it, he spoke, and immediately checked himself again. Slowly he went on to the end of the line, his momentum running down as he approached the grave that stood separate from the others, the way he had ordered it. He read the inscription. Then he squatted down comfortably on his haunches beside it, and stayed there until the sun settled, and the wind turned cold and plaintive. Only then he went to his saddle and loosened the blanket roll. There was no firewood, and he slept fitfully in the cold of the night and the icier cold of his thoughts. In the morning he went back to Saul's grave. For the first time he noticed that grass was growing up between the stones of the cairn and that the cross sagged a little to one side. He shrugged off his coat and went down on his knees, working like a gardener over the grave, weeding out the grass with his hunting knife, making certain the roots were removed. Then he went to the head and lifted the rocks away from around the cross. He tore the cross from the ground and re-dug the hole for it, setting it up again carefully, plugging the base with pebbles and earth, and at last packing the whitewashed rocks firmly around it once more. He stood back, brushed earth and flakes of whitewash from his hands, and surveyed his handiwork. It still was not right. There was something missing. He thought about it, frowning heavily until he found the answer. Flowers, he grunted, and lifted his head towards the aloes on the copy above him. He set off up the slope, picking his way through the litter of boulders towards the summit. His knife slipped easily through the soft, thick stems, and the juice oozed heavily from the wounds. With an armful, he started back down the slope. Out to one side, a patch of colour caught his eye a sprinkling of pink and white among the boulders. He detoured towards it. Hottentot daisies, each one a perfect trumpet with a pink throat and a fragile yellow tongue. Delighted with his find, Sean laid aside his burden of aloe blooms and went in amongst them. Stooping like a reaper, he worked through them towards the lip of a narrow ravine, gathering the flowers into posies and binding the stems together with grass. Finally he reached the ravine and straightened up to rest his aching back. The ravine was narrow. He could have jumped across it with little effort, but it was deep. 
He peered down into it without much interest. The cleft was floored with rain-washed sand, and his interest quickened as he made out the half-buried bones of a large animal. But what made him climb down into the ravine was not the bones, but the bulky leather object entangled with them. Sliding on his backside the last few feet of the descent, he reached the bottom and examined his find. A leather mule pack, double pouches, and the buckles of the harness almost rusted away. He tugged the whole lot loose from the sand and was surprised at the weight of it. The leather was dry and brittle, faded almost white with exposure, and the locks of the pouches were rusted solid. With his knife he slit the flap of one pouch, and out of it cascaded a stream of sovereigns. They fell into the sand, clinking upon each other in a heap that glittered with merry golden smiles. Sean stared at them in disbelief. He dropped the pack and squatted on his haunches over the pile. Timidly, he picked up one of the discs and examined the portrait of the old president, before lifting the coin to his mouth and biting down upon it. His teeth sank into the soft metal, and he removed it from his mouth. Well, damn me sideways, he invited, and he laughed out loud. <laughs> Rocking back on his haunches and lifting his face to the sky, he roared out his jubilation and his relief. It went on and on until his laughter dried suddenly, and he sobered. Cupping a double handful of the gold, he asked it, Now where the hell did you come from? And his answer was in the grim face embossed upon each coin. Boar gold. And who do you belong to? The answer was the same, and he let the coins trickle through his fingers. Boar gold. The hell it is, he growled angrily. Starting this minute, it's Courtney gold. And he began to count it. As his fingers worked, so did his brain. He prepared his case against his own conscience. They owed him the balance outstanding on a train of wagons filled with ivory. They owed him his deposits in the Volkskast Bank. They owed him for a shrapnel wound in the leg and a bullet in the belly. They owed him for three years of hardship and danger. And they owed him for a friend. As he stacked the sovereigns into piles of twenty, he considered his case, found it good and proven, justified it, and gave judgment in his own favour. I find for the appellant, he announced, and concentrated his whole attention on the counting. An hour and a half later, he reached the total. There was a huge pile of coins upon the flat rock he had used as a desk. He lit a cheroot, and the smoke he drew into his lungs made him light-headed. His conscience had surrendered unconditionally, and in its place was a sense of well-being, all the more intense for the period of depression through which he had come. Sean Courtney accepts from the government of the one-time Republic of the Transvaal an amount of £29,200 in full discharge of all debts and claims. He chuckled again and began shoveling the gold back into the leather pouches. With the heavy pack slung over his shoulders and with his arms full of wildflowers, Sean went down the copy. He saddled his horse and loaded the pack onto his mule before he went to pile the flowers on Saul's grave. They made a brave show of colour against the brown grass. He lingered another hour fussing over his floral arrangements and resisting the temptation to thank Saul, for now he had decided the gold was not a gift from the Republican government, but from Saul Friedman. This made it even easier to accept. At last he mounted and rode away. As the man and his horses dwindled into insignificance on the great brown plain, a dust devil came dancing up from the south, a tall spinning column of heated air and dust and fragments of dry grass. It weaved and swayed towards the graveyard below the copy. For a time it seemed as though it would pass wide of it, but suddenly it changed direction and dashed down upon the double row of crosses. It snatched up the flowers on Saul's grave, lifted them, ripped their petals, and scattered them widely across the plain. Chapter 72 With Michael beside him lugging the carpet bag, which was the heaviest item of luggage, Sean left the buggy and crossed the sidewalk into the offices of the Ladyburg Banking and Trust Company. Oh, Colonel Courtney, the young lady at the reception desk enthused, 
I'll tell Mr. Pye you're here. Please don't bother. I'll carry the glad news myself. Ronnie Pye looked up in alarm as the door of his office flew open, and the two of them walked in. Good morning, Ronnie. Sean greeted him cheerfully. Have you bled any good stones today, or is it still too early? Guardedly, Ronnie murmured a reply and stood up. Sean selected a cigar from the leather box on the desk and sniffed it. Not a bad line in horse dung you've got here, he remarked and bit the end off. Match, please, Ronnie. I'm a customer. Where are your manners? Reluctantly, suspiciously, Ronnie lit the cigar for him. Sean sat down and placed his feet on the desk with ankles neatly crossed. How much do I owe you? he asked. The question heightened Ronnie's suspicion, and his eyes settled on the carpet bag in Michael's hands. You mean altogether, capital and interest? Capital and interest, Sean affirmed. Well, I, I'd have to work that out. Give it to me in round figures. Well, very roughly, you understand, it would be around, oh, I don't know, say, um, he paused. That carpet bag looked confoundedly heavy. Its sides bulged, and he could see the tension in Michael's arm muscles as he held it. Uh, say, £22,816.15. shillings. As he named the exact figure, Ronnie dropped his voice in veneration, the way a primitive tribesman might invoke the name of his god. Sean lowered his feet. Then he leant forward and swept the papers that covered the desk to one side. Very well. Pay the man, Michael. Solemnly, Michael placed the bag in the cleared space. But when Sean winked at him, his solemnity cracked and he grinned. Making no attempt to hide his agitation, Ronnie plunged both hands into the mouth of the bag and withdrew two pouches of unbleached canvas. He loosened the drawstring of one and spilled gold onto his desk. Where did you get this? he demanded angrily. At the end of the rainbow. There's a fortune here, Ronnie protested, as he dipped into the carpet bag again. A goodly amount, I'll admit. But, but, Ronnie was scratching in the pile of coins, hunting for the secret of their origin like a hen for a worm. However, Sean had spent a week in Johannesburg and another two days in Pietermaritzburg, visiting every bank and exchanging small parcels of Kruger coin for Victorian and Portuguese, and the coin of half a dozen other states. For a minute, Sean watched his efforts with a smile of happy contentment. Then he excused himself. Uh, we'll be getting on home now. Sean placed an arm around Michael's shoulder and led him to the door. Deposit the uh, balance to my account, there's a good fellow. Further protests stillborn on his lips, and despair mingled with frustration, Ronnie Pye watched through the window as Lion Cop Wattle Estates climbed up into the buggy, settled its hat firmly, waved a whip in courteous farewell, and trotted sedately out of his clutches. All that summer the hills of Lion Cop echoed to the thud of axes and the singing of hundreds of Zulus. As each tree toppled and fell in a froth of heaving branches, men with cane knives moved forward to strip the rich bark and tie it in bundles. Every train that left for Peter Maritzburg towed truckloads of it to the extract plant. Each long day together strengthened the bonds between Sean and Michael. They evolved a language of their own, notable only for its economy of words. Without lengthy discussion, each took charge of a separate sphere of lion cop activity. Michael made himself responsible for the maintenance of equipment, the loading and dispatch, all the paperwork and the ordering of material. At first, Sean surreptitiously checked his work, but when he found no fault in it, he no longer bothered. They parted only at the end of each week, Sean to Peter Maritzburg, for obvious reasons, and Michael to Tuniskral in duty. Michael hated those returns home. He hated Anna's endless accusations of disloyalty and her occasional fits of weeping, but even worse was the silent reproach in Gary's face. Early each Monday morning, with the joy of a released convict, he set off for Lion Cop and Sean's welcome. What about those bloody axe handles, Mike? Only in the evenings they talked freely, sitting together on the stoop of the homestead. They spoke of money and war and politics and women and wattle, and they talked as equals, without reserve, as men who worked together with a common purpose. Dirk sat quietly in the shadows and listened to them. Fifteen years old, but Dirk had a capacity for hatred out of all proportion to his age, and he used it all on Michael. 
Sean's handling of Dirk was in no way different. His school attendance was still spasmodic. He trailed Sean about the plantations and received his full share of rough affection and even rougher discipline. Yet he sensed in the relationship between Sean and Michael a terrible threat to his security. Merely by reason of age and experience, he was excluded from the evening discussions on the stoop. His few contributions were received with indulgent attention. Then the talk would be resumed as though he had not spoken. Dirk sat quietly planning in lurid detail his assassination of Michael. On Lion Cop that summer, there were small thefts and unexplained acts of vandalism, all of which affected only Michael. His best riding boots vanished. His single dress shirt was ripped down the back when he came to don it for the monthly dance at the schoolhouse. His pointer bitch whelped a litter of four puppies, which survived only a week before Michael found them dead in the straw of the barn. Ada and her young ladies began preparing for the Christmas of 1904 in the middle of December. As their guests, Ruth and Storm, came down from Peter Maritzburg on the 20th, and Sean's frequent absences from Lion Cop left a heavy burden of work on Michael. There was an air of mystery in the Proteus Street cottage. Sean was strictly excluded from the long sessions in Ada's private rooms, where she and Ruth retired to plan the wedding dress. But this was not the only secret. There was something else which was keeping all the young ladies in fits of suppressed giggles and excitement. With a little eavesdropping, Sean gathered it was something to do with his Christmas present from Ruth. However, Sean had other worries, chief of which was maintaining his position in the fierce competition for Miss Storm Friedman's favours. This included a heavy expenditure on sweetmeats, which were delivered to Storm without Ruth's knowledge. The Shetland pony had been left in Peter Maritzburg, and Sean was required to substitute at the cost of his dignity and grass stains on the knees of his breeches. As reward, he was invited to take tea each afternoon with Storm and her dolls. Favourite among all Storm's dolls was a female child with human hair and an insipid expression on its large china face. Storm wept with a broken heart when she found that china head shattered into many pieces. With Sean's help, she buried it in the backyard, and then stripped Ada's garden of flowers for the grave. Sullenly, Dirk watched the funeral. Storm was now completely reconciled to her loss, and so thoroughly enjoyed the ceremony that she insisted Sean exhume the body and start again. In all, the doll was buried four times, and Ada's garden looked as though a swarm of locusts had descended upon it. Chapter 73 Christmas Day started early for Sean. He and Michael supervised the slaughter of ten large oxen for the Zulu labour force, then distributed pay and gifts. To each man a khaki shirt and short pants, and for each of their wives a double handful of coloured beads. There was much singing and laughter. Mbijani, risen from his sickbed for the occasion, made a speech of high dramatic content. Unable to prance on his freshly healed legs, yet he shook his spears, postured and roared his questions at them. Has he beaten you? Ayebo! They hurled the negative back at him. Has he fed you? Ebo! Explosive accent. Is there gold in your pockets? Yebo! Is he our father? He is our father. All to be construed not to, literally, Sean grinned. Then he stepped forward to accept the large earthen pot of millet beer that Nbijani's senior wife presented to him. It was a matter of honour that this be emptied without removing it from the lips, a feat which Sean and then Michael both accomplished. Then they climbed up into the waiting buggy. Nbijani took the reins, and with Dirk on the seat beside him, drove them down to Ladyburg. After the first flurry of greeting and good wishes, Ruth led Sean into the backyard, followed by everyone else. There stood a large object covered by a tarpaulin, which was ceremoniously removed, and Sean gaped at what Ruth had given him. Its paintwork burnished to a high gloss, metal parts and polished leather upholstery sparkling in the sun, stood a motor vehicle. Stamped in the huge metal wheel hubs, and below the mascot on the radiator were the words, Rolls-Royce. Sean had seen these fiendishly beautiful machines in Johannesburg, and now he was overcome by the feeling of unease they had given him then. My dear Ruther, I, I, I haven't the words to thank you. 
he kissed her heartily, to delay the moment when he must approach the monster. Do you really like it? Like it? It, it's the most magnificent thing I've ever seen. Over her shoulder, Sean noticed with relief that Michael had taken over. As the only engineer present, he was seated behind the wheel and speaking authoritatively to the crowd about him. Get in, Ruth ordered. Let me, um, let me look at it first. With Ruth on his arm, Sean circled the rolls, never approaching closer than half a dozen paces. The great headlights glared at him malevolently, and Sean averted his eyes. His unease was slowly becoming genuine fear as he realised that he was expected not only to ride in the thing, but to direct its course and speed. Unable to delay longer, he approached and patted the bonnet. Hey there, he told it grimly. With an unbroken animal, you must establish mastery from the first contact. Get in, Michael was still in charge, and Sean obeyed, placing Ruth in the middle of the front seat and himself nearest the door. On Ruth's lap, Storm bounded and squealed with excitement. The delay while Michael consulted the handbook at length did nothing for Sean's confidence. Ruth, don't you think it's wise to leave Storm behind just this first time? Oh, she isn't any trouble, Ruth regarded him quizzically, then smiled. It's really quite safe, darling. Despite her assurance, Sean stiffened in terror when the motor finally roared into life. And he held that pose, staring fixedly ahead during the whole of their triumphal progress through the streets of Ladyburg. Citizens and servants boiled from the houses along their route and lined the road to cheer in wonder and delight. At last they were back in Proteus Street, and when Michael stopped outside the cottage, Sean escaped from the vehicle like a man waking from a nightmare. He firmly vetoed the suggestion that the family motor to church on the grounds that it was irreverent and in bad taste. The Reverend Smiley was flattered that Sean remained awake throughout the sermon, and judged by Sean's worried expression that at last he was in fear of his soul. After church, Michael went out to Tunis Kral to eat Christmas dinner with his parents, but returned early in the afternoon to begin Sean's instruction. The entire population of Ladyburg turned out to watch Sean and Michael circling the block at a walking pace. By early evening, Michael decided that Sean was ready for a solo circuit, and accordingly he disembarked. Alone at the wheel, Sweating nervously, Sean looked at the sea of expectant faces around him and saw Mbijani grinning hugely in the background. Mbijani, he bellowed. Ngorsi, come with me. And Mbijani's grin dissolved. He backed away a little. It was unnatural that a vehicle should move of its own accord, and Mbijani wanted no part of it. Ngorsi, there is much pain still in my legs. Among the crowd were many of the Zulu labourers from Lion Cop who had come down from the hills when news of the miracle reached them. Now one of these laughed in such a manner as to cast doubt on Mbijani's courage. Mbijani drew himself to his full height and withered the man with his eyes. Then he stalked proudly to the rolls, sat on the seat beside Sean, and folded his arms across his chest. Sean drew a deep breath and gripped the steering wheel with both hands. His eyes narrowed and he scowled ahead down the road. Clutch in, he muttered to himself, in gear, brake off, throttle down, clutch out. The rolls leapt forward so violently that both he and Ibijani were nearly thrown over the back of the seat. Fifty yards further on the machine expired from lack of fuel, a stroke of good fortune because it was unlikely that Sean would have been able to remember the procedure for stopping it. Grey of face and unsteady of limb, Ibijani alighted from the rolls for the last time. He never rode in it again, and secretly Sean envied him his freedom. He was greatly relieved to hear that it would be weeks before more fuel could be sent up from Cape Town. Chapter 74 Three weeks before Sean's wedding, Ada Courtney went into her orchard one morning early to pick fruit for breakfast. She found Mary there, dressed in her white nightgown and hanging by her neck, from the big avocado pear tree. Ada cut her down and sent one of the servants to call Dr. Fraser. Between them they carried the dead girl to her cubicle and laid her on her bed. While Doc Fraser made a hasty examination, Ada stood staring down at the face, 
that death had made more pitiful. What depths of loneliness drove her to this? she whispered, and Doc Fraser pulled the sheet over the corpse and looked across at Ada. That wasn't the reason. In fact, it might have been better if she were a little more lonely. He pulled out his tobacco pouch and began to load his pipe. Who was her boyfriend, Aunt Ada? She had none. She must have. Well, why do you say that? Aunt Ada, this girl was four months pregnant. It was a small funeral, just the Courtney family and Ada's girls. Mary was an orphan, and she had no other friends. Two weeks before the wedding, Sean and Michael finished the season's cut of bark and switched the Zulus to planting out the blocks destroyed by the fire. Together they drew up a draft profit and loss account, combining their rudimentary knowledge of accounting and arguing far into the night, they finally agreed that from 1,500 acres of wattle they had cut 1,420 tonnes of bark to gross a little over 28,000 pounds sterling. But here all agreement ended. Michael insisted that the stocks of material and expenditure on planting of new trees be carried forward, giving a net profit for the year of 9,000 pounds. Sean wanted to write all expenditure off against income and show a profit of 1,000. So they deadlocked and finally sent all the books to a qualified accountant in Peter Maritzburg. This gentleman sided with Michael. They then considered the prospects for the coming season, and were a little awed when they realised that there would be 4,000 acres of wattle to reap, and an expected gross of £80,000 sterling, always providing there were no more fires. That evening, without Sean's knowledge, Michael wrote two letters, one to a manufacturer of heavy machinery in Birmingham, whose name and address Michael had furtively copied from one of the huge boilers in the Natal Wattle Estate Company's plant, the other to the firm of Foyles Booksellers in Charing Cross Road, London, requesting the immediate dispatch of all and any literature on the processing of wattle bark. Michael Courtney had caught from Sean the habit of dreaming extravagantly. He had also acquired the trick of setting out to make those dreams become reality. Three days before the wedding, Ada and her young ladies set out for Peter Maritzburg by train, and Sean, Michael and Dirk followed in the rolls. The three of them arrived dusty and bad-tempered outside the White Horse Hotel. It had been a nerve-wracking journey. Sean had enlivened it by shouting incessant warnings, instruction and blasphemy at Michael, the driver. Slow down, for God's sake, slow down. Do you want to kill us all? Look out, look out, watch that cow. Don't drive so close to the edge. Dirk had done his share by demanding halts for urination, hanging over the sides, climbing tirelessly between the front and back seats, and urging Michael to exceed the speed limit set by Sean. Finally, in anger, Sean had Michael stop the car and administered corporal punishment with the birch of a milk-boss tree cut from beside the road. On arrival, Dirk was met by Ada and led away snivelling. Michael took the rolls and disappeared in the direction of the Natal Wattle Company's plant, where he was to spend most of the following three days snooping and asking questions. And Sean went to find Jan Polis Larue, who had come down from Pretoria in response to Sean's wedding invitation. By the day of the wedding, Michael Courtney had compiled a small volume of notes on wattle processing, and Jan Polis had given Sean a minute account of the aims and objects of the South African party. But in response to his urgings, Sean had promised only to think about it. The wedding ceremony had given everybody much cause for thought. Although Sean had no qualms about marrying in a synagogue, yet he steadfastly refused to undergo the painful little operation which would enable him to do so. His half-hearted suggestion that Ruth should convert to Christianity was met with a curt rejection. Finally, a compromise was agreed and Ben Goldberg persuaded the local magistrate to perform a civil ceremony in the dining room of the Golds. Ben Goldberg gave the bride away, and Ma Goldberg wept a little. Ruth was magnificent in Ada's creation of green satin and seed pearls. Storm wore an exact miniature of Ruth's dress, and sparked off a minor brawl with the other flower girls during the ceremony. Michael, as best man, conducted himself with a plum. He quelled the riot among the flower girls, produced the wedding ring on cue, and prompted the groom when he muffed his lines. 
The reception on the lawns was attended by a huge crowd of the Goldbergs' friends and business associates, and by half the population of Ladyburg, including Ronnie Pye, Dennis Peterson and their families. Garrick and Anna Courtney were not there, nor had they acknowledged the invitation. Brilliant sunshine blessed the day, and the lawns were smooth and green as expensive carpets. There were long trestle tables laden with the fruits of Mar Goldberg's kitchen and the products of Ben Goldberg's brewery. Storm Friedman went from group to group of guests, boosting up her skirts to display the pink ribbons in her pantaloons until Ruth caught her at it. Having found his first taste of champagne very much to his liking, Dirk went on to drink six glasses of it behind the rose bushes. He was then copiously ill. Fortunately, Michael found him before Sean did and spirited him away to one of the guest bedrooms and left him there to languish. With Ruth on his arm, Sean inspected the display of wedding gifts and was impressed. He then circulated among the crowds on the lawn until he reached Jan Polis and fell into an earnest political discussion. Ruth left them to it and went to change into her going-away clothes. The prettiest and most blonde of Ada's young ladies caught the bouquet. Immediately thereafter, she caught Michael's eye and blushed to match the crimson carnations in her hand. Amid a hum of appreciative comment and a snowstorm of confetti, Ruth returned and, like a queen ascending the throne, took her seat in the rolls. Beside her, Sean, in dust coat and goggles, steeled himself, muttered his usual incantations and gave the rolls its head. Like a wild horse, the machine seemed to rear on its hind wheels and then tear down the driveway, scattering gravel and guests, Ruth clutching desperately at a large hatful of ostrich feathers and Sean shouting at the rolls to, Whoa, whoa, whoa there, girl, whoa! They headed out along the road that led through the valley of a thousand hills to Durban and the sea and disappeared in a tall column of dust. Chapter 75 Three months later, having picked up Storm from Mar Goldberg en passant, they reappeared at Lion Cop Homestead. Sean had put on weight, and both of them had that smugly complacent look found only in the faces of couples returning from a successful honeymoon. On the front stoop and in the outbuildings of Lion Cop were the crates and packing cases which contained wedding gifts, Ruth's furniture and carpets, and the additional furniture and curtains they had purchased in Durban. Ruth, ably assisted by Ada, threw herself joyously into the task of unpacking and moving in. Meanwhile, Sean began a tour of inspection of the estate to determine how much of it had suffered in his absence, and he felt vaguely cheated when he found that Michael had managed very well without him. The plantations were trim and cleared of undergrowth. The vast black scar through their centre was nearly obliterated with freshly planted rows of saplings. The labour force was half as productive again under the new incentive payment scheme which Michael, in consultation with the accountant, had introduced. Sean gave Michael a lecture on not getting too bloody clever and learning to walk before you can run, which he ended with a few words of praise. Thus encouraged, Michael approached Sean one night when he was alone in the study. Sean was in a state of deep contentment induced by a meal from an enormous roast sirloin which he was digesting, by the fact that Ruth had finally agreed to his adoption of Storm and the change of her name from Friedman to Courtney, and by the prospect of joining Ruth in their gargantuan double bed just as soon as he'd finished his brandy and his hand-rolled Havana cigar. "'Come in, Michael, sit down, have a brandy,' Sean greeted him genially, and almost defiantly Michael crossed the Persian carpet and laid a thick sheaf of papers on the desk in front of him. "'What's this all about?' Sean smiled at him. Read it and you'll see. Michael retreated to a chair across the room. Still smiling, Sean glanced at the heading on the top sheet. Preliminary estimates and ground plan for proposed tannin extraction plant, Lion Copper States. The smile faded. Sean turned the page, and as he read he began to frown, and then to scowl. When at last he finished, he relit his dead cigar and sat in silence for five minutes while he recovered from the shock. Who put you up to this? Nobody. Where would you sell your extract? Page five. The outlets are all listed there, and the ruling prices over the last ten years. This plant needs 20,000 tonnes of bark a year, 
If we planted every foot of lion cop and mahubus club to wattle, we could only supply half of that. We'd buy the rest from the new estates along the valley. We could offer a better price than Jackson, because we'd save railage to Peter Maritzburg. Oh, and who would run the plant? I'm an engineer. On paper you are, Sean grunted. Well, what about water? We'd dam the Baboonstrom above the falls. For an hour, Sean poked and prodded at the scheme, seeking for a soft spot. His agitation mounted as Michael calmly met each of his queries. All right, Sean growled. You've done your homework. Now answer me this one. How the hell do you propose finding £70,000 to finance this little lot? Michael closed his eyes, as though he were praying. His jaw was a hard, thrusting line. And suddenly Sean wondered why he had never noticed the strength in that face, the stubborn, almost fanatical determination. Michael opened his eyes again and spoke softly. A loan on Lion Cop and Mahubas Kloof for 25000 a notarial bond on the plant for as much again, and a public share issue on the balance. Sean jumped up from his desk and roared, No! No, no! Why not? Still calmly and reasonably. Because I've spent half my life in debt up to here. Sean grabbed his own throat. Because now at last I'm in the clear and I want to stay that way because I know what it feels like to have more money than I need and I don't like the feeling. Because I'm happy just the way things are now, and I don't want to catch another lion by the tail and have him turn round and claw the hell out of me. He stopped panting and then shouted, Because a certain amount of money belongs to you. But more than that, you belong to it. Because I don't want to be that wealthy again. Lean and fast as an angry leopard, Michael came out of his chair and smashed a bald fist onto the top of the desk. He glared across at Sean flushed, angry red under his tan, quivering like an arrow. Well, I do. Your only objection to my plan is that it's sound, he blazed. Sean blinked in surprise and then rallied. If you get it, you won't like it, he bellowed, and Michael matched his volume. Well, let me be the judge of that. At that moment, the door of the study opened, and Ruth stood on the threshold and stared at them. They looked like a pair of game cocks with their hackles up. What on earth is going on? she demanded. Both Michael and Sean looked up guiltily. Then slowly they relaxed. Michael sat down and Sean coughed awkwardly. Uh, we were just having a discussion, my dear. Well, you've woken Storm and just about torn the roof off. Then she smiled and crossed to take Sean's arm. Why don't you leave it until tomorrow? Then you can continue the discussion at twenty paces with pistols. The pygmies of the Ituri forests hunt elephant with tiny arrows. Once the barb is lodged, they follow quietly and doggedly, camping night after night on the spoor, until at last the poison works its way to the animal's heart and brings it down. Michael had placed his arrowhead deep in Sean's flesh. Chapter 76 at Lion Cop, Ruth found a happiness she had never expected, had not believed existed. Up to this time, her existence had been ordered and determined by an adoring but strict father, and then in the same manner by Ben Goldberg. The few short years with Saul Friedman had been happy, but now they were as unreal as memories of childhood. Always she had been wrapped in a cocoon of wealth, hemmed in by social taboos and the dignity of the family. Even Saul had treated her as a delicate child for whom all decisions must be made. Life had been placid and orderly, but deadly dull. Only twice she had rebelled, once to run away from Pretoria, and again when she had gone to Sean in the hospital. Boredom had been her constant companion. But now suddenly she was mistress of a complex community. The sensation had been a little overpowering at first, and from habit she had appealed to Sean for him to make the fifty decisions that each day brought forward. I'll make a bargain with you, he answered. You don't tell me how to grow wattle, and I'll not tell you how to run the house. Put the damn sideboard where it looks best. Hesitantly at first, then with growing confidence, and at last with sureness and pride, she made Lioncop into a home of beauty and comfort. The coarse grass and scrub around the homestead fell back to make room for lawns and flower beds. The outer walls of Lion Cop gleamed in a crisp new coat of whitewash. Inside, the yellow wood floors shone like polished amber 
setting off the vivid Bukhara carpets and draped velvet curtains. After a few disastrous experiments, the kitchens began to yield a succession of meals that moved Michael to raptures, and even Sean pronounced them edible. Yet with a dozen servants, she had time for other things, to read, to play with Storm, and to ride. Sean's wedding gift to her was a string of four golden palominos. There was time also for long visits from and with Ada Courtney. The two of them established an accord stronger than that of mother and daughter. There was time for dancing and barbecues. There was time for laughter and for long, quiet evenings when she and Sean sat alone on the wide front stoop or in his study and talked of many things. There was time for love. Her body, hard from riding and walking, was also healthy and hot. It was a sculpture sheathed in velvet and fashioned for love. There was only one dark place in her happiness. Dirk Courtney. When her overtures were met with sullenness and her small, specially cooked gifts were rejected, she realised the cause of his antagonism. She sensed the bitter jealousy which was eating like a canker behind those lovely eyes and the passionately beautiful face. For days she prepared what she would say to him. Then she found the opportunity when he came into the kitchens while she was alone. He saw her and turned quickly to leave, but she stopped him. Oh, Dirk, please don't go. I, I want to discuss something with you. He came back slowly and leaned against the table. She saw how tall he had grown in the last year. His shoulders were thickening into the shape of manhood, and his legs were strong and tapered from the narrow hips that he thrust forward in a calculated insolence. Dirk, she began and paused. Suddenly, she was unsure of herself. This was not a child, as she had imagined. There was a sensuality in that beautiful face she found disturbing. He carried his body with awareness, moving like a cat. Suddenly she was afraid, and she swallowed jerkily before she went on. I know, I know um, how difficult it's been for you since Storm and I came to live here. I, I know how much you love your father, how much he means to you, but... She spoke slowly, her carefully prepared speech forgotten so that she had to grope for the words to explain. She tried to show him that they were not in competition for Sean's love, that all of them, Ruth, Michael, Storm and Dirk, formed a whole, that their interests did not overlap, but that each of them gave to Sean and received from him a different kind of love. When at last she faltered into silence, she knew he had not listened, nor tried to understand. Dirk, I like you and I want you to like me. With a thrust of his buttocks against the table, Dirk straightened up. He smiled then and let his eyes move down over her body, slowly. Can I go now? he asked, and Ruth stiffened. Then she knew there was no compromise, that she would have to fight him. Yes, Dirk, you may go, she answered. She knew with sudden clarity that he was evil, and if she lost this contest, he would destroy her and her child. In that moment, she was no longer afraid. Cat-like, Dirk seemed to sense the change in her. For a moment, she thought she saw a flicker of doubt, of uncertainty in his eyes. Then he turned away and sauntered out of the kitchen. She guessed that it would come soon, but not as soon as it did. Every afternoon, Ruth would ride out into the plantations with Storm's pony on a lead rein beside her. They made a game of finding Sean and Michael, following the labyrinth of roads that crisscrossed through the blocks of trees, guided by the vague directions of the gangs of Zulus, until finally they ran them down and delivered the canteens of coffee and the hamper of sandwiches. Then all four of them would picnic on the soft carpet of dead leaves beneath the trees. This afternoon, dressed in riding habit and carrying the hamper, Ruth came out into the kitchen yard. The young Zulu nursemaid was sitting in the shade of the kitchen wall, flirting with one of the grooms. Storm was nowhere in sight, and Ruth asked sharply, Where is Miss Storm? She went with Nkozana Dirk. And Ruth felt the tingling premonition of danger. Where are they? And the nursemaid pointed vaguely in the direction of the stables and outbuildings that sprawled away down the back slope of the hill. Come with me, 
Ruth dropped the hamper and ran with her skirts gathered in one hand. She reached the first row of stables and hurried down them, glancing into each stall as she passed. Then into the feed rooms with the big concrete bins and the smell of oats and molasses and chopped lucerne, mixing with the sharp tang of dung and dubbined leather. Out again into the sunlight, running for the barns. Storm screamed in terror just once, but high and achingly clear, so the silence afterwards quivered with the memory of it. The harness room. Ruth swirled in her run. Oh, God, please, no, don't let it happen. Please, please. She reached the open door of the harness room. It was gloomy and cool within the thick stone walls, and for a moment the scene made no sense to Ruth. Her back wedged into the far corner, Storm stood with hands lifted to shield her face. Small fingers rigid, splayed open, spread like the tip feathers of a bird's wing. Her body shook silently with her sobs. In front of Storm, squatting on his heels, Dirk leaned forward with one hand outstretched, as though he offered a gift. He was laughing. Then Ruth saw the thing in Dirk's hand move, and she froze with horror. It uncoiled from around his wrist and slowly reached out towards Storm, its head cocked back in a half-loop of its body, tiny black tongue vibrating between the grinning pink lips. Ruth screamed, and Dirk jumped to his feet and spun to face her, with his right hand hidden behind his back. From the corner, Storm darted across the room and buried her face in Ruth's skirts, weeping piteously. Ruth picked her up and held her tight against her shoulder, but she never took her eyes off Dirk's face. <laughs> it's only a Roy slung, Dirk laughed again, but nervously. They're harmless, I was only having a joke. He brought the snake out from behind his back, dropped it onto the stone flag floor, and crushed its head under the heel of his riding boot. He kicked it away against the wall. Then, with an impatient gesture, he brushed the black curls from his forehead and made to leave the room. Ruth stepped across to block his path. Nanny, take Miss Storm back to the house. Gently, Ruth handed the child to the Zulu nursemaid and closed the door after them and slid the bolt across. Now it was darker in the room. Two square shafts of sunlight filled with moving dust motes fell from the high windows, and the quiet was spoiled only by the sound of Ruth's laboured breathing. I was only having a joke, Dirk repeated, and grinned defiance at her. I suppose you will run and tell my father. The walls of the room were studded with wooden pegs from which were suspended the harness and saddlery. Beside the door hung Sean's rawhide stock whips, eight foot of braided leather tapering from the butt handle into nothingness. Ruth lifted one down from the rack and flicked the lash out to lie upon the floor between them. No, Dirk, I'm not going to tell your father. This thing is between you and me alone. And what are you going to do? I'm going to settle it. How? Still grinning, he placed his hands on his hips. Beneath rolled sleeves, his upper arms bulged smooth and brown, as though they had been freshly oiled. Like this, Ruth flicked her skirt aside and stepped forward. Using the whip underhand, she sent the lash snaking out to coil around Dirk's ankle, and immediately she jerked back on it. Taken completely off balance, Dirk went over backwards. His head hit the wall as he fell, and he lay stunned. To give herself space in which to wield the whip, Ruth moved into the centre of the room. Her anger was cold as dry ice. It gave strength to arms already finely muscled from riding, and it seared away all mercy. Now she was a female animal fighting for the survival of herself and her child. She had learned to use a stock whip in the process of becoming an expert horsewoman, and her first blow split Dirk's shirt from the shoulder to the waist. He shouted with anger, and rolled onto his knees. The next blow cut down from the base of his neck along his spine, paralysing him in the act of rising. The next, across the back of both knees, knocked his legs out from under him. On his belly, Dirk reached for the pitchfork against the wall, but braided leather exploded around his wrist. He shouted again, and rolled on his side to nurse the hand against his chest. Ruth hit him, and he writhed across the floor towards her like a wounded leopard, with its hindquarters shattered by buckshot. Step by step, Ruth retreated before him, and the long lash hissed and cracked. Without mercy, she beat him until his shirt hung in tatters from his waist and shoulders, exposing the smooth white skin with the fat crimson welts superimposed upon it. 
She beat him until his shouts turned to shrieks and finally to sobbing. She beat him until he lay shivering, moaning, moving feebly with his blood sprinkled in dark blobs on the stone paving around him. Then she folded the whip and turned to open the door. In the stable yard, standing in silent curiosity, were gathered all the grooms and the household servants. Ruth selected four of them. Take the Inkosana to his room. Then to one of the grooms. Ride to Inkosi. Tell him to come quickly. Sean came quickly. He came wild with anxiety and nearly tore the door off Dirk's bedroom in his haste. He stopped dead on the threshold and stared aghast at Dirk's back. Stripped to the waist, Dirk lay face downwards on his bed, and Ruth worked over him with a sponge. On the table beside her stood a steaming basin, and the pungent reek of antiseptic filled the room. Good God, what happened to him? I beat him with a stock whip, Ruth answered him calmly, and Sean gaped at her, then dropped his gaze to Dirk. You did that? Yes. The anger tightened Sean's mouth. Jesus God, you've cut him to pieces, you've half killed him. And he glanced at Ruth. Why? It was necessary. The absolute assurance and lack of remorse in her reply confused Sean. He was suddenly uncertain in his anger. What did he do? I can't tell you that. It is something private between us. You must ask Dirk. Sean crossed quickly to the bed and knelt beside it. Dirk, Dirky, my boy, what happened? What did you do? And Dirk lifted his face from the pillow and looked at his father. It was a mistake. It doesn't matter. Then he buried his face in the pillow once more, and his voice was muffled, so Sean had an excuse for not believing that he had heard correctly. What did you say? he demanded, and there was a short delay before Dirk replied quite s distinctly. I said it was my fault. Yes, that's what I thought you said. Sean stood up with a puzzled expression on his face. Well, I don't know why you sent for me, Ruth. You seem to have the situation fairly well in hand. He moved to the door, looked back as though he were going to speak, then, changing his mind, he shook his head and went out. That night, in the quiet, exhausted minutes before sleep, Sean murmured against her cheek. I think you did today what I should have done years ago. And then, with a sleepy chuckle, at least there's no doubt in anyone's mind as to who is the mistress of Lion Cop. Chapter 77 There was a guileless simplicity in Sean's approach to life. In his mind, any problem when met with direct action disintegrated. If you became obsessed with a woman, you tumbled her. If that didn't produce the desired effect, then you married her. If you wanted a piece of land, or a horse, or a house, or a gold mine, then you paid your money and took it. If you didn't have the money, you went out and found it. If you liked a man, you drank with him, hunted with him, laughed together. If you disliked him, you either punched him in the head, or subjected him to a ponderous sarcasm and mockery. Either way, you left him in no doubt of your feelings. When a son got out of hand, you wailed the tripe out of him, then gave him an expensive present to demonstrate your affection. Now Sean admitted he had been tardy in the matter of Dirk, but Ruth had done a most effective job. It only remained for him to call Dirk into the study and shout at him a little. A week later he returned from a trip to Peter Maritzburg and with an embarrassed scowl presented to Dirk his peace offerings. The first was a brass-bound leather case which contained a handmade shotgun by Greener of London. Tooled silver inlay, glossy walnut stock and butt, and interchangeable Damascus barrels. The other was a two-year-old filly from the Huguenot stud at Worcester in the Cape. By Sun Lord out of Harvest Dance, Sun Dancer was an animal of the most distinguished blood in Africa and of surpassing beauty and speed. Sean paid a thousand guineas for her and considered he had got the best of the bargain. As far as he was concerned, there was no longer any problem with Dirk, and Sean could devote all his energy to furthering the three major ventures in which he was engaged. Firstly, there was the matter of putting Ruth with child. Here he had her wholehearted cooperation. But their efforts, apart from providing a deal of healthy exercise and pleasure, 
was singularly unproductive. Sean remembered the deadly skill he had shown in their first encounter, and was puzzled. Ruth suggested they keep in training until the rainy season began. She had developed a superstitious belief in the power of thunder. On one of his trips to Peter Maritzburg, Sean saw a carved wooden statue of Tor in a junk dealer's window. He bought it for her, and from then on, the gods stood on their bedside table, clutching his hammer and overlooking their strivings with such a knowing expression that at last Ruth turned him face to the wall. Then there was Michael's tannin extract plant. He had resorted to a piece of underhand villainy that shocked Sean, and, he professed, killed his belief in the essential decency of mankind. Michael had visited each of the new growers along the valley, men who had followed Sean's lead in the planting of wattle, and after swearing them to secrecy, had offered them shares in the company. They were enthusiastic, and with Michael at the head, they visited Lion Cop in formal deputation. The meeting was conducted with so much verbal thunder and lightning thrown about that the great god Tor might have been in the chair. At the end, Sean, who had teased the idea all the months since Michael had approached him, and who was now as enthusiastic as any of them, allowed himself to be persuaded. He spoke for seventy percent of the shares, and the balance was allotted to the other growers. A board of directors, with Sean as chairman, was elected, and the accountant was instructed to proceed with the registration of the Ladyburg Wattle Cooperative Limited. For the first time, Sean exercised his majority vote to crush the misgivings of the other shareholders and appoint Michael Courtney as plant engineer. Then, with an older director to act as a steadying influence, Michael was put aboard the next Union Castle mailship for England, a letter of authority in his pocket, and Sean's warnings and words of wisdom in his head. Remembering himself at the age of twenty-three, Sean decided it necessary to point out to Michael that he was being sent to London to buy machinery and increase his knowledge of it, not to populate the British Isles, nor to tour their hostelries and gaming establishments. There was swift reaction from Jackson at Natal Wattle, who regretted that the contracts between the Tugela Valley growers and his company would not be renewed, and that owing to heavy demands from elsewhere, he could no longer supply seed or saplings. But Sean's seed beds were now well enough established to meet the needs of the whole valley, and with luck, their plant would be in production by the beginning of the next cutting season. Before Michael and his chaperone returned flushed with the success of their mission, Sean had another visitor. Jan Polis Larue, wary of the three-year argument he and Sean had conducted with the aid of the postal authority, arrived at Ladyburg and expressed his intention of staying until Sean agreed to head the Natal branch of the South African Party and to contest the Ladyburg seat at the next Legislative Assembly elections. Two weeks later, after he and Sean had hunted and killed a number of guinea fowl, pheasant and bushbuck, had consumed huge quantities of coffee, and more moderate quantities of brandy, had talked to each other hoarse, and had closed the last gap between them. Young Polis left on the Johannesburg train with the parting words, Duma, it's settled then. The South African Party's platform was a federation of the Cape, the Transvaal, the Orange Free State, and Natal, under government responsible to Whitehall. It was opposed by extreme English and Dutch opinion the Jingoes who shouted God save the King, and the Republicans who wanted the Almighty to treat the King differently. After meeting with the men on the list Jan Polis had given him, Sean began the campaign. His first convert was Ruth Courtney, won over by the prospect of the excitement associated with an election battle rather than by Sean's oratory. Now a week or more of every month was spent in travelling about Natal to attend political gatherings. Ruth rehearsed Sean in his speech, he had only one, until he was word perfect. She kissed the babies and played hostess to the wives, tasks in which Sean showed no special aptitude. She sat beside him on the platform and restrained him from going down into the audience to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with hecklers. The way she smiled and the way she walked certainly lost no votes for the South African party. From London, Lord Caisterbrook promised his support and it looked as though Sean could count on twenty-two seats out of the Assembly's thirty. On the level ground below the escarpment, 
hard by the baboon strum, the plant of the Ladyburg Wattle Cooperative took shape. It covered ten acres of ground, and beyond it the cottages of the employees were laid out in neat blocks. Despite Michael's vehement protests, Sean bowed to the will of his fellow directors, and a consulting engineer was employed until such time as the plant was in production. Without him they would have lost a year's harvest of bark, for although Michael was eager and tireless, yet he was a young man with no practical experience. Even with the older man to help him, the plant was still a long way from ready before the season's cutting began. When at last the tall silver smokestack began spewing smoke, and the furnaces lit the night with a satanic glow, there were thousands of tons of bark piled up in the open-sided warehouses around the factory. It was a wonderful season. Good rains had filled the bark with rich sap, and when the year ended, the cooperative had shown a profit of £10,000 on its first year's operation. Lion Cop Estates, a profit four times greater. Sean had been in and out of debt as swiftly as a small boy visits the bathroom when sent to wash his face. Despite the good rains, there were only three spectacular storms that summer. On each occasion, Sean was away from Lion Cop on business. While the lightning leapt across the hills, and the hammer strokes of thunder broke over the valley, Ruth stood at the window of their bedroom and lamented another wasted opportunity. Bijani did much better. All his seed brought forth fruit, and he reaped four fat sons that season. Chapter 78 It was a busy year for Dirk Courtney also. After his resounding defeat at the thin end of the stock whip, Dirk and Ruth fell into a state of wary neutrality, but he conceded control of Lion Cop to her. Storm Courtney he ignored, unless she was in Sean's lap or riding on his shoulder. Then he watched them covertly until he could find an excuse to interrupt their play or to get away from Lion Cop. His absences became more frequent. There were trips to Peter Maritzburg and the surrounding districts to play rugby and polo. There were mysterious night excursions to Ladyburg, and in the day he rode away at dawn each morning. Sean believed he rode to school, until he received a note from the headmaster asking him to call. After showing him the attendance register and a copy of Dirk's academic record, the headmaster leaned back in his chair and waited for Sean's comments. Not so good, eh? I agree, Mr. Courtney. Not so good. Couldn't we send him to a boarding establishment somewhere, Mr. Bazant? Yes, we could do that. Bizant agreed dubiously. But would it serve any real purpose, apart from providing him with expert coaching in rugby football? Well, how else will he get his university entrance? Sean was impressed with what higher education had done for Michael. He looked upon it as a sovereign alchemy for all the ills of youth. Um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Courtney, the headmaster hesitated delicately. He had heard of Sean's temper and did not want a personal demonstration of it. Some men uh, are not really suited for university training. I want Dirk to go, Sean interjected. I doubt that either Stellenbosch or Cape Town universities share your ambitions. The schoolroom manner reasserted itself for a moment, and Bezant spoke with dry sarcasm. You mean he's stupid? Sean demanded. No, 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 hurriedly Bezant soothed him. It's just that he's not, shall we say academically inclined. Sean pondered on that a while. It seemed a very nice distinction, but he let it go and asked, Well, what do you suggest? Bazant's suggestions was that Dirk Courtney get the hell out of his school, but he phrased it gently. Although Dirk is only sixteen, he is very mature for his age. Say you were to start him at the Wattle Company. You recommend I take him away from school, then? Sean asked thoughtfully, and Byzant suppressed a sigh of relief. Dirk Courtney was apprenticed to the foreman boilermaker at the factory. His first action was to inform his journeyman that he'd be running this show one day, and what was he going to do about it. That gentleman, forewarned by Dirk's reputation, regarded him dolefully, spat a long squirt of tobacco juice an inch from Dirk's gleaming toe cap, and replied at some length. He then pointed to a kettle on the workshop forge, 
and told Dirk to make him a cup of coffee, and while he was about it to remove his thumb from his posterior orifice. Within a week the two of them were cronies, and the man, whose name was Archibald Frederick Longworthy, began to instruct Dirk in arts other than the fabrication of steel plate. Archie was thirty-six years old. He had come out to Africa after completing a five-year term in Leavenworth Prison for the intriguing offence of crime and injuria, and when he explained the meaning, Dirk was delighted. Archie introduced Dirk to one of his friends, Hazel, a plump and friendly girl who worked at the Ladyburg Hotel as a barmaid and dispensed her favours in the same cheerful manner that she did her liquor. But Dirk quickly became her favourite, and he learned some pretty little tricks from her. Shrewdly, Archibald Longworthy examined the situation and decided that nothing but profit could come from friendship with Sean Courtney's heir, besides which the boy was a lot of fun. He could tumble a tart and swig gin with the best of them. Also, he had a seemingly inexhaustible supply of sovereigns. In exchange, Dirk Hero worshipped Archie, diverting much of his feelings from his father to his first real friend. Ignoring the grey wrists and neck which bespoke Archie's disaffection for soap and water, the pale, wispy hair through which pink scalp showed, ignoring also the black tooth in the front of his mouth, Dirk invested him with the glamour and excitement of an old-time pirate. When Dirk found himself to be suffering from a painless but evil-smelling condition, it was Archie who assured him it was only whites, and went with him to a doctor in Peter Maritzburg. On the train coming home, they planned their revenge with much laughter, comradely banter, and rising anticipation. Hazel was surprised to see them in the middle of a Sunday afternoon. She sat up quickly as they came into her room overlooking the backyard of the hotel. Dirky, you shouldn't come here in the daytime. Your pa will find out. It was warm in the shabby little room, and the smell of cheap scent and a half-filled chamber pot blended harshly with the odour of female perspiration. Hazel's thin chemise clung damply to her body and outlined the heavy hang of her breasts and the deep lateral fold around the level of her navel. There were dark smudges below her eyes, and a curl was sweat-plastered down her cheek where the pillow had left little creases in the skin. The two of them stood in the doorway and grinned at her. From many experiences, Hazel recognised the wolfish eagerness those grins masked. "'What do you want?' Suddenly she was afraid, and instinctively she covered the deep cleft of her bosom with one hand. Dirky here wants to have a little chat with you. Carefully Archie closed the door and turned the key in the lock. Then he ambled towards the bed. Manual labour had sheathed his arms in hard, knotty muscle, and the hands that hung at his sides were disproportionately large and coated with coarse blonde hair. You keep away from me, Archie Longworthy. Hazel swung her legs off the bed. The chemise pulled up to expose fat white thighs. I don't want no trouble. You just leave me alone. You give Dirk here a clap. Now Dirk here is my friend, and he don't like what you give him. I didn't. It couldn't have been me, man. I'm clean, I tell you. She stood up, still holding the front of her chemise closed, and backed away from him. You keep away from me. Then as Archie jumped forward. No, no, don't. I'll and she opened her mouth to scream, but Archie's hand closed over it like a great hairy spider. She struggled desperately, clawing at the hand over her face. Come on, Dirk, Archie chuckled, as he held her easily with one arm around her waist. Uncertainly, Dirk hesitated at the door, no longer grinning. Come on, old man, I'll hold her. With a sudden swing of his arm, Archie hurled the girl face down on the bed then jumped across to keep her mouth smothered in the pillow. Come on, Dirk, use this. With his free hand, Archie unbuckled the wide belt he wore. The leather was studded with blunt metal spikes. Double it over. Hell's teeth, Archman, you reckon we should? Dirk still hesitated, the belt hanging limply from his hands. You scared or something? And Dirk's mouth hardened at the jibe. He stepped forward and swung the belt in a full overarm stroke across the wriggling body. Hazel froze at the sting of it, and she gasped explosively into the pillow. That's the stuff. Hold on a second. Archie hooked his thumb into the thin fabric of her chemise and ripped it down from the shoulder blades to the hem. 
her fat woman's buttocks bulged through, dimpled and white. Go on now, give it hell! Again Dirk lifted the heavy, doubled leather. He stood poised like that while a sensation of giddy power buoyed him upwards to the level of the gods. Then he swung his body down into the next stroke. Chapter 79 He's unopposed, Ronnie Pye murmured, and beside him Garrick Courtney stirred uneasily. Have you heard him speak? Ronnie persisted. No. He wants to throw in the towel with that bunch of Dutchmen up in the Free State and Transvaal. Yes, I know. Do you agree with him? Gary was silent. He seemed to be engrossed with the antics of the small herd of foals in the paddock in front of them, as they chased each other on legs that seemed to have too many joints, clumsy in their fluffy baby coats. I'm sending twenty yearlings up to the show sales in Peter Maritzburg. Should average about four or five hundred a head, because they're all first-class animals. Be able to let you have a sizable payment on the bond. Oh, don't worry about that now, Gary. I didn't come out here looking for money. Ronnie offered his cigar case, and when Gary refused, he selected one himself and began preparing it carefully. Do you agree with this idea of a union? No. Why not? Ronnie did not look up from his cigar. He did not want to show his eagerness prematurely. I fought them. LaRue, Niemant, Buta, Smuts. I fought them, and we won. Now they're sitting up there in Pretoria, calmly plotting to take over the whole country. Not just the Free State and the Transvaal, but Natal and the Cape as well. Any Englishman who helps them is a traitor to his king and his country. He should be put up against the wall and shot. Yes, well, quite a few people around here think that way. Quite a few. And yet no one is opposing Sean Courtney. He's just going to walk into the assembly. Gary turned and began limping slowly along the paddock fence towards the stables, and Ronnie fell in beside him. Seems to me, and the others, we need a good man to put against him, someone with a lot of prestige, good war record, man who's written a book and knows what he's saying and what's going on, knows how to use words. If we could find someone like that, then we'd be happy to put up the expense money. He struck a match and waited for the sulphur to clear before he lit his cigar and spoke through the smoke. Only three months to election time. We've got to get organised right away. He's holding a meeting at the schoolhouse next week. Sean's political campaign, which had been ambling along mildly without causing much interest, suddenly took on new dramatic quality. His first meeting in Ladyburg was attended by most of the local population, all of them so starved for entertainment that they were prepared to listen to Sean reel off the little speech that they had already read, reported verbatim in most of the Natal newspapers. With hardy optimism, they hoped that question time might be more rewarding, and some of them had prepared queries on such momentous matters as the price of hunting licences, the public library system, and the control of foot-and-mouth disease. At the very least, it was an opportunity to meet friends from the outlying areas. But apart from Sean's employees, friends and neighbours, others arrived at the schoolhouse and filled the first two rows of desks. All of them were young men Sean had never seen before, and he eyed them with heavy disapproval while they laughed and joked loudly during the preliminaries. Where did this bunch come from? he demanded of the chairman. Oh, they came in on the uh, afternoon train, uh, all in one party. Seems as though they're looking for trouble. Grimly, Sean sensed in them, the slightly feverish excitement of men stealing themselves to violence. Most of them have been on the bottle. Now, Sean, Ruth leaned across and laid her hand on his knee. You must promise not to get worked up. Don't antagonise them. Sean opened his mouth to reply. Then left it like that as Gary Courtney came in through the crowd around the doorway and moved across to sit with Ronnie Pye in the back row. Close your mouth, darling, Ruth murmured and Sean obeyed, then smiled and waved a greeting to his brother. Gary replied with a nod, and immediately fell into deep discussion with Ronnie Pye. Amid coughing and feet shuffling, the chairman rose to introduce Sean to men who had been his schoolmates, who had drunk his brandy and hunted with him. He went on to tell them how Sean had won the Anglo-Boer War virtually single-handed, how he had brought prosperity to the district with his factory and his wattle. Then he ended with a few remarks that had Sean squirming in his seat and trying to get two fingers into his collar. 
So, ladies and gentlemen of our fair district, I give you a man of vision and foresight, a man with a heart as big as his fists, your candidate and mine, Colonel Sean Courtney. Sean stood up smiling, to be rocked by a blast of jeers and catcalls from the front rows. The smile faded, and his fists curled into great bony hammers on the table in front of him. He scowled down on them, beginning to sweat with anger. A light tug on the tail of his coat steadied him, and his fists opened a little. He began to speak, bellowing above the shouts of, Sit down! Speak up! Have him a chance! Stand down! And the thunder of booted feet stamping in unison on the wooden floor. Three times in the uproar he lost the run of his speech, and had to turn to Ruth for prompting, scarlet in the face with anger and mortification, while waves of derisive laughter broke over him. He ended up reading out the last half from his notebook. It made little difference that he stumbled and lost his place repeatedly, for no one more than three feet away could hear a single word. He sat down, and a sudden silence descended on the hall, an air of expectancy that made Sean realise that this must have been carefully planned, and that the main entertainment was still to follow. Mr. Courtney, at the back of the hall, Gary Courtney was on his feet, and every head was craned around towards him. May I ask you a few questions? Sean nodded slowly. So, that's what it is. Gary had planned this reception. My first question, then. Can you tell us what the name is for a man who sells his country to the enemies of his king? Traitor! Traitor! howled the hecklers. Boer! They stood up in a mass and roared at him. The pandemonium lasted perhaps five minutes. I'm taking you out of here, Ruth whispered to Ruth and reached for her arm. But she pulled away. No, I'm staying. Come on, do as I tell you. This is going to get rough. You have to carry me out first, she flared at him, angry and beautiful. Sean was about to accept the challenge, when suddenly the uproar ceased abruptly. Again, all heads turned towards Garrick Courtney, where he stood ready with his next question. In the silence, he grinned maliciously. One other thing. Do you mind telling us the nationality and faith of your wife? Sean's head jerked back. He felt the sickening physical jolt of it in his stomach, and he started to struggle to his feet. But Ruth was already standing, and she laid a hand on his shoulder to prevent him rising. I think I will answer that one, Gary, she spoke clearly with just that trace of huskiness in her voice. I am a Jewess. The silence persisted. Still with her hand on Sean's shoulder, standing straight and proud beside him, she held Gary's stare across the room. Gary broke first. Flushing up along his neck, he dropped his eyes and shifted clumsily on his bad leg. Among the men in the front rows, the same guilty reaction followed her words. They glanced at each other and then away, moving awkwardly in shame. A man stood up and started down the aisle towards the door. Halfway there, he stopped and turned. I'm sorry, missus. I didn't know there'd be any of that. And he went on towards the door. As he passed Ronnie Pye, he tossed a sovereign into his lap. Another man stood up, grinned uneasily at Ruth, and hurried out. Then, in twos and threes, the others followed him. The last of them trooped out in a bunch, and Sean noted with relish that not all of them had returned Ronnie's sovereigns. At the end of the schoolroom, Gary dithered, uncertain whether to leave or to stay, and attempt to brazen his way out of a situation he had so seriously misjudged. Sean stood up slowly and encircled Ruth's waist with one arm. He cleared his throat, for it was choked with his pride of her. Not only that, he called, but she's one of the best goddamn cooks in the district also. In the laughter and cheers that followed, Gary stumbled and pushed his way out of the room. Chapter 80 the following day, Garrick Courtney announced his intention of contesting the Ladyburg seat as an independent. But not even the loyalist newspapers gave him an outside chance of winning. Until six weeks before polling day. On that evening, long after dark, Dirk hitched Sundancer at the rail outside the hotel. After he had loosened the girth and slipped the bit from her mouth, 
he left her to drink at the trough and went up to the sidewalk. As he sauntered past the bar, he peered in through the large window with its golden red lettered slogan, Got a thirst? Drink a Goldberg beer. Quickly he checked the clientele at the bar for informers. They were none of his father's foremen. They were always dangerous. Nor were Messrs. Peterson or Pye or Erasmus present this evening. He recognised two of the factory mechanics, a couple of railway gangers, a bank clerk, a counterhand from the Cooperative Society, among the half-dozen strangers, and he decided that it was safe. None of these ranked high enough in Ladyburg society to carry news to Sean Courtney of his son's drinking habits. Dirk walked to the end of the block, paused there for a few seconds, and then strolled casually back. But his eyes were restlessly checking the shadows for tail carriers. Tonight the main street was deserted, and as he came level with the swing doors of the bar, he stepped sideways through them and into the warm yellow lamplight of the saloon. He loved this atmosphere. He loved the smell of sawdust, liquor, tobacco smoke and men. It was a place of men, a place of rough voices and laughter, of crude humour and companionship. A few of the men along the bar glanced up as he entered. Hello, Dirk. We missed you. Where have you been all week? Dirk returned Archie's greeting self-consciously, and when he walked to take the stool beside him at the end of the bar counter, he held himself erect and swaggered a little, for this was a place of men. Good evening, Dirk. What'll it be? The barman hurried across to him. Hello, Henry. Is it all right tonight? Dirk dropped his voice to a whisper. It should be. We aren't expecting any snoopers, Henry reassured him. But the door behind you isn't locked. Dirk's seat in the corner had been selected with care. From it he could survey each newcomer to the room while being screened himself by the drinkers along the counter. Behind him, a door led through the wash-up into the backyard, a necessary precaution when you're seventeen, and both the law and your father forbid you liquor. OK, then I'll have a drink. Give me the usual, Dirk nodded. You're out late tonight, Henry remarked as he poured gin into a tumbler and filled it with bottled ginger beer. You been out hunting again? Henry was a small man in his early fifties, with a pale, unsunned face and little blue eyes, and now as he asked the question he winked one of them at Archie Longworthy. Did you get it tonight? Archie took over the catechism. Dirk laid a finger along the side of his nose. What do you think? He grinned, and they all laughed delightedly. Oh, who was it then? Madame? Archie drew him out, playing for the other listeners, who were leaning forward, still chuckling. Oh, ah! Dirk shrugged contemptuously. Madame was the code name of the wife of one of the railway drivers. Her husband ran the night train to Peter Maritzburg every alternate day. She was not considered much of a conquest. Well, who then? Henry kidded softly. I'll let you know when I'm finished nesting there myself, Dirk promised. A pretty one, they insisted. Young, hey? Uh, she's all right. Not too bad, Dirk tasted his gin. Man, you get so much you don't hardly appreciate it any more, Archie chided him, grinning at his audience, and Dirk bridled with pleasure. Oh, come on, Dirk, tell us, man. Is she hot? For answer, Dirk extended one finger cautiously and touched his glass, hissed sharply as though he had touched red-hot steel, and jerked his hand back with an exclamation of pain. They roared with appreciation, and Dirk laughed with them, flushing, eager for their acceptance. Come on, give us the story, Henry insisted. You don't have to give us the name, just give us the details. Where did you take her? Well, Dirk hesitated. Oh, come on, Dirk. Tell us about it. And, of course, he obliged, telling it in detail, so that the indulgent quality of their laughter changed and they leaned closer to him, listening hungrily. Jesus, did she say that? Oh, then what did you do? They encouraged him. And Dirk told them. He was a natural storyteller, and he built up the suspense until there was a small island of attentive silence around him. But the rest of the barroom was louder with laughter and voices than it had been when he entered. One group in particular were feeling their liquor. So I took her hand, Dirk went on, and I said, Now I've got a little surprise for you. What is it? she asked, as though she didn't know. Close your eyes and I'll show you, I told her. And a voice rang loudly from across the room. Oh, you take that big ugly bastard Courtney, 
What does he do except drive around in a big motor car and make speeches? Dirk stopped in the middle of a sentence and looked up. Suddenly his face was pale. The man who had spoken was one of the group at the far end of the bar. He was dressed in a shabby overall of blue denim, a man no longer young, with the lines of hardship etched deep around his eyes and mouth. You know who gives him his money? I tell you, we give it to him. Without these he'd be finished. He wouldn't last a month. The man held up his hands. They were calloused, and the nails were split and ragged, encrusted with dark semicircles of dirt. That's where he gets his money. Colonel Bloody Courtney. Dirk was staring across at the speaker. His hands lay clenched on the counter in front of him. Now suddenly the room was very quiet, so that the man's next words seemed even louder. You know what he pays? Thirty-two pounds a month, top journeyman's wages. Thirty-two pounds a month. Well, the minimum rate is twenty-five, one of his companions observed dryly. I reckon you're free to move on to a better job, if you can find it. Me, I'll stay on here. That's not the point. The big idle bastard's making a fortune out of us. I reckon he can afford to pay more, I reckon. Do you reckon you're worth that much? Dirk jumped up from his stool and shouted the question down the length of the counter. There was a stir of interest, and every head turned towards him. Leave him, Dirk. He's drunk. Don't start anything, Henry whispered in agitation, and then raising his voice and turning to the other. Hey, you've had enough, Norman. Time you were on your way. Your old lady will be waiting dinner for you. Good God! Norman was peering in Dirk's direction, his eyes focusing blearily. Good God, it's Courtney's pup! And Dirk's face set into nervous rigidity. He began to walk slowly down the room towards the man. Leave him, Dirk, leave him! To restrain him, Archie caught his arm as he passed, but Dirk shrugged it off. You insulted my father. You called him a bastard. Yes, yeah, that's right. Norman nodded. Your daddy's a bastard, right? Your daddy's a big lucky bastard who's never done a full day's work in his life. A big lucky blood-sucking bastard. And he's whelped an equally useless pup who spends his time... Dirk hit him in the mouth. And he went over backwards off the stool, flailing his arms as he fell. He hit the floor with his shoulders and rolled onto his knees, spitting blood and a broken tooth from his mouth. You little bastard! he mouthed through the blood. Dirk stepped forward with his left foot and swung his boot with the whole weight of his body behind it. The toe of his boot thudded into the man's chest and flung him onto his back. Christ, stop him! shouted Henry from behind the bar. But they sat paralysed as Dirk stooped for the bar stool, lifted it above his head and then brought it down, swinging his body with it as though he were chopping a log. The heavy wooden seat hit the man in the centre of his forehead. It hit solidly, for the back of his head was against the floor and could not give way the blow. It split his skull cleanly, and twin spurts of blood shot from his nostrils into the sawdust on the floor. You've killed him! A single voice broke the long silence that followed. Yes, Dirk agreed. I've killed him. I've killed a man. It sang within him savagely. It came up and filled his chest so that he could hardly breathe, and he stood over the corpse, not wanting to miss a moment of it. He felt his legs trembling under him, the muscles of his cheeks so tight with excitement, they felt they must tear. Yes, I killed him. His voice was choked with the violence of the pleasure that gripped him. His vision narrowed down so that the dead man's face filled the whole field of it. The forehead was deeply dented, and the eyes bulged from their sockets. Around him there was a sudden bustle of consternation. You'd better send for his father. I'm getting out of here. No, you stay where you are. Nobody must leave. My God, call Doc Fraser. Doc's not wanted. Get the police. He was so quick, like a bloody leopard. Christ, I'm getting out of here. Two of them stooped over the body. Leave him, snapped Dirk. Don't touch him. Jealous as a young lion of its kill. And instinctively they obeyed. They stood up and moved away. With them, everyone else drew back, leaving Dirk standing alone. Get his father, repeated Henry. Someone ride out and call Sean Courtney. An hour later, Sean strode into the room. He wore an overcoat over his nightshirt, and his boots had been pulled hurriedly over his bare feet. He stopped on the threshold and glared around the room. 
his hair in wild disorder from sleep. But when he entered, the atmosphere in the room changed. The tense silence relaxed, and every face turned eagerly towards him. Oh, Mr. Courtney, thank God you've come, blurted the young police constable who was standing beside Dr. Fraser. Oh, how bad is it, Doc? Sean asked. He's dead, Sean. Pa, he insulted... Dirk started. Shut up, Sean ordered him grimly. Who is he? he fired at the constable. Norman van Eck, one of your fitters from the mill. How many witnesses? Fourteen of them, sir. They all saw it. Right, Sean ordered. Get the body down to the police station. You'll be able to take statements from them tomorrow morning. Uh, what about the accused? I mean, what about your son, sir? The constable corrected himself. I'll be responsible for him. I, I'm not sure that I... I shouldn't... Uh, he saw the expression on Sean's face. Well, well, I, well, that'll be all right, I suppose, he agreed reluctantly. Pa! Dirk started again. I told you to keep your mouth shut. You've done enough damage for one night. Sean spoke without looking at him. Then to the barman. Fetch a blanket. Then to the police constable. Get some of them to help you. And he pointed towards the window, which was lined four deep with curious faces. Very well, Mr. Courtney. After they had shuffled out with the blanket-wrapped body, Sean glanced significantly at Dr. Fraser. I'd better get down there, complete my examination. You go ahead, Sean agreed, and the doctor packed his bag and went. Sean closed the door behind him and slammed the shutters across the window. Then he turned to the men who stood anxiously along the bar. Well, what happened? They stirred restlessly and looked everywhere but at him. You, George? Sean selected one of his mechanics. Well, Mr. Courtney, your, uh, your Dirk went up to Norman and hit him off the stool. Then he kicked him as he was trying to get up. And then he picked up the stool and hit him with it. The mechanic stumbled hoarsely through his explanation. Did this man provoke him? Sean demanded. Well, he called you, uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Courtney, he called you a, a big, idle, a, a blood-sucking bastard. Sean frowned quickly. Did he now? Uh, what else did he say? Uh, he said uh, he said you were a slave owner, uh, that you starved your men. He said that he was, he was going to get even with you sometime. Archie Longworthy took over the telling of it with a note of interrogation in his voice as he glanced around at the others for support. After a few seconds, there was a guilty nodding of heads and a few murmurs of agreement. Archie took courage from it. He sort of hinted that he was, he was going to wait for you one night and get even. Did he say that in, in so many words? Sean's presence dominated the room, with such an obvious air of authority, that when Archie looked again for support, he found it in their faces. He said, One night I'm going to wait for that big bastard, then I'll show him a few things. Archie gave them the exact words. No one protested. Well, then what happened? Well, then he sort of picked on young Dirk. And here's Courtney's brat, he said. Yellow as his old man, I reckon. And what did Dirk do? Sean asked. Well, Mr. Courtney, he just laughed like a, like a gentleman, sort of nice and friendly. Forget it, he said. You've had too much to drink. A sudden thought occurred to Sean. What was Dirk doing in here, anyway? Well, it's like this, Mr. Courtney. A few weeks ago he lent me a couple of pounds. I asked him to call round here tonight so I could give it back to him. That's all it was. He wasn't drinking, then? Sean asked suspiciously. Good Lord, no! Archie was so obviously shocked at the suggestion that Sean nodded. All right, then, then what happened? He pursued. Well, Norman went on ribbing him, calling him a coward and all that. I can't remember the exact words, but at last young Dirk lost his temper. He walked across and hit him off the stool. Well, I guess Norman deserved that. What do you think, boys? Archie looked at them again. Yeah, that's right. That's, it's fair made my blood boil to hear him picking on Dirk like that. The mechanic backed him up, and the others murmured agreement. Well, then, Archie took up the tale again. Norman's lying on the floor and pulls out his knife. There was a rustle of astonishment from along the bar. One man opened his mouth and lifted his hand in protest, but suddenly, embarrassed, he carried the gesture through and massaged his neck. Knife? What knife? Where's it now? Sean leaned forward eagerly. 
Standing beside him, Dirk began to smile softly. When he smiled, his face was beautiful. Here's the knife. Henry the barman reached under the counter and brought out a large bone-handled clasp knife. Everybody in the room stared at it blandly. Well, how did it get there? Sean asked. And now, for the first time, he was aware of the sickly, guilt-ugly faces in front of him. He knew then for certain it was a lie. I took it off Norman afterwards. We thought it best you should be the first one to know the truth, you being his father and all. Archie wriggled his shoulders ingratiatingly and smiled around at his witnesses. Slowly, Sean turned to the man nearest to him, the bank clerk. Is this the knife? with which Norman van Eck threatened my son. Uh, yes, Mr. Courtney, the man's voice squeaked unnaturally. Sean looked at the man beyond him and repeated the question exactly. Yes, that's the one, sir. That's it, yes, uh, no doubt about it, that's it. He asked each man in turn, and each answered the same. Dirk, Sean came last to him. He asked it slowly and heavily, looking into the clear, innocent eyes of his son. As God is your witness, did Norman van Eck draw this knife on you? Please, my son, deny it now. Say it so they can all hear you. If you value my love, tell me the truth now. Please, Dirk, please, he said to himself. All this he tried to say, tried to convey it with the sheer force of his gaze. As God is my witness, Pa, Dirk answered him, and was silent again. You have not answered, Sean insisted. Please, please, my son. He drew that knife from the hip pocket of his overalls. The blade was closed. He opened it with the thumbnail of his left hand, Pa, Dirk explained softly. I tried to kick it out of his hand, but hit his chest instead. He fell onto his back and I saw him raise the knife as though he were going to throw it. I hit him with the stool. It was the only way I could stop him. All the passion went out of Sean's face. It was stony and hard. Very well, he said. We'd better get home now. Then he addressed the rest of the barroom. Thank you, gentlemen. And he walked out through the door to the rolls. Dirk followed him meekly. The next afternoon, Dirk Courtney was released by the local magistrate into his father's custody on bail of fifty pounds pending the visit of the circuit court two weeks later, when he was to stand trial on a charge of manslaughter. His case was set down at the head of the court list. The whole district attended the trial, packing the tiny courthouse and clustering at each of its windows. After a retirement of seven minutes, the jury brought back its verdict and Dirk, walking out of the dock, was surrounded by the laughing, congratulating crowd and borne out into the sunlight. In the almost deserted courtroom, Sean did not rise from his seat in the front row of chairs. Peter Aronson, the defence lawyer Sean had imported from Peter Maritzburg, shuffled his papers into his briefcase, made a joke with the registrar, and then walked across to Sean. In and out in seven minutes exactly. That's one for the record book. When he smiled, he looked like a koala bear. Have a cigar, Mr. Courtney. Sean shook his head, and Peter thrust a disproportionately large cigar into his own mouth and lit it. I tell you truly, though, I was worried by the knife business. I expected trouble there. I didn't like that knife. No more did I, Sean agreed softly. And Peter held his head on one side, examining Sean's face with bright bird-like eyes. But I like those witnesses. A troop of performing seals. Bark, you say to them. Woof, woof, just like magic. Someone trained them pretty well. I don't think I understand you, Sean said to him grimly, and Peter shrugged. I'll post my account, but I warn you, I'm going to hit you with a big one. Say five hundred guineas? Sean lay back in his seat and looked up at the little lawyer. Say five hundred, he agreed. Next time you need representation, I recommend a bright youngster name of Rolf. Humphrey Rolf, Peter went on. You think I'll need a lawyer again? With your boy, you'll need a lawyer, Peter told him with certainty. And you don't want the job, Sean leaned forward with sudden interest. At five hundred guineas a throw? 
Money I can get anywhere. Peter took the cigar from his mouth and inspected the fluffy grey ash at its tip. Remember the name, Mr. Courtney? Humphrey Rolf. He's a bright boy, and not too fussy. He walked away down the aisle, lugging his heavy briefcase, and Sean stood up and followed him slowly. Pausing on the steps of the courthouse, he looked across the square. The centre of a small knot of men, Dirk stood laughing, with Archie Longworthy's arm around his shoulder. Archie's voice carried to where Sean stood. Don't let any of you get the idea you can tangle with Dirky here. You will end up with your teeth busted clean out the back of your head. Archie grinned, so that the blackened tooth showed. I say it so you can all hear me. Dirky here is my friend, and I'm proud of him. You alone, thought Sean. He looked at his son and saw how tall he stood, shaped like a man, broad in the shoulders with muscle in his arms, no fat on the belly, and long legs dropping away clean from hips. But he's only sixteen, he's a child. Perhaps there is still time to prevent him setting hard. Then, with truth, he knew he was deceiving himself, and he remembered what a friend had said to him long, long ago. Some grapes grew in the wrong soil, some were diseased before they went to the press, and others were spoiled by a careless vintner. Not all grapes make good wine. And I am the careless vintner he thought. Sean walked across the square. You're coming home, he told Dirk harshly, knowing as he looked at the lovely face that he no longer loved his son. The knowledge nauseated him. Congratulations, Colonel, I knew we'd win, Archie Longworthy beamed, and Sean glanced at him. I'll be in my office ten o'clock tomorrow morning. I want to talk to you. Essa, grinned Archie happily. But he was not grinning when he left Ladyburg on the following evening's train, with a month's pay in lieu of notice to compensate him.